Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here at the Navy League's annual Sea Airspace Conference and Trade Show outside Washington, D.C. at National Harbor. And we have with us Steve Sloan, who is the uh, program manager of the LPD-17 over here at Huntington Ingalls Industries. Um, talk to us a little bit about the variant you guys have here. It's the missile defense variant of it. Uh, it's something when uh, uh, Deputy Defense Secretary Bob Work was the number two in the United States Navy, was enthusiastic about the idea of converting an LPD-17 in order for the missile defense mission. What kind of capabilities would this bring to the force? Okay. Uh, thank you, Vago, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. This is a uh, combatant variant of an LPD-17. The amphibious capability is removed from the ship, and it would have all of the things that a, that a cruiser would have and uh, provide fleet defense and uh, missile defense uh, for the fleet and or for allies or even uh, homeland defense. You, it has a very large radar, uh, whereas the Aegis Cruiser today has a 12-foot uh, radar and the AMDR on the Flight 3 will have a 14-foot radar. This has up to a 35-foot radar. So you're talking about seeing well in excess of 1,000 miles, uh, as many vertical launch cells as the Navy would ever want to put on the ship. We have 96 depicted in the model here, but we could go uh, greater than that. We can put a, a longer missile that would have a longer range and have the ability to, uh, to engage uh, threats at a much greater distance and allow a ship like this to stand off uh, from uh, coastal defenses but actually provide defense over the fleet or, uh, again, ballistic missile uh, defense. So it's equipped with railgun. We envision an integrated power system similar to DDG-1000 but maybe not identical to that and uh, embarked aircraft. Uh, a true asset that uh, as the navies uh, look at their future fleet architecture, it makes sense to us to consider taking a hot production line like LPD and uh, modifying it much like we did the Spruance to the Ticonderoga to make this a, a formidable combatant for the Navy. Now why would the Navy, for example, given that the number of missile tubes is really not particularly different from what would be on a, on a Flight 3 or whether a standard uh, Flight 2 Burke, why would you want to be applying this kind of a ship, this kind of an approach, as opposed to just detailing a Burke, for example, uh, to do that job or even a Tyco? Frankly, to have the kind of the size of the radar that's needed uh, to do the missions to look out further as missiles are getting faster, as Russia and China and other potential uh, adversary countries are developing faster missiles, you have to be able to spot them further away. You have to have the processing power in that radar in order to engage those kinds of threats. So we have a rail gun. We think that lasers would be appropriate uh, for defense. And and the the big key is you need a ship with a greater beam than the DDG. 51 has to carry that large radar. And when you're looking at what's the maximum number of tubes, and are you talking about the Mark 41 tubes or the newer version and the larger diameter tube that we're seeing on the DDG-1000 aboard the Zumwalt class? Uh, the ship could uh, be configured to carry either one. It could carry as many as 288 Mark 41 cells like they have on the um, on the Aegis ships today, or it could carry half that amount of the Mark 57s, like the uh, so 144 of the Mark 57s. Talk to us a little bit about what the state of the requirement now is uh, in terms of you know what the Navy's thinking on this is because this obviously is is a is a work study it's an intellectual exercise for you guys is a little bit like the uh, the frigate for example the the naval patrol frigate uh, variant of your national security cutter where are we on the requirement for this right. Well, Vago, I think the Navy and, uh, and the requirements makers are looking to industry to come up with innovative ideas. And when I, when I look at taking existing capabilities and cobbling them together in a new way to perhaps meet future requirements, I don't think the Navy is fully defined and they're coming through in their fleet architecture studies what they want to replace the Ticonderoga cruiser, what's coming after Flight 3. This is a ship by taking existing capabilities like this that the Navy could go and procure and have operational in a, in a a decade's time, whereas we know that a new hull takes 15 to 20 years to get into production. Um, from a manpower standpoint, what sort of crewing is there? And talk to us also about the endurance of the ship, because obviously for any missile defense application, presence is everything, right. and on-station time is absolutely the, the measure of merit in some respects. Right. 
talk to us a little bit about both of those. Certainly. The, uh, the crew size we envision would be similar to a, a Aegis DDG or Destroyer today. We could look uh, to potentially more automation of the engineering plant and maybe uh, take, the, take the crew size down even a little bit more than that. We actually looked at a variant of the ship that had a mixed crew of uh, an MSC type model of civilian mariners and Navy that we got down to about 170 people, but that was not a weaponized variant. It was more a, uh, a tracking and uh, ballistic missile type uh, uh, application only. But for a multi-mission combatant, probably about the same size as an, as an Aegis uh, uh, DDG. So we're around 300, 320 people or so. That's correct. And in terms of endurance? In terms of endurance, uh, what we didn't do, uh, since we had a lot of ballast tanks on the ship, is uh, you could convert some of those to fuel. We didn't take down the size of the uh, storage for food or anything else from carrying 600 Marines. So you easily, easily have four or five times the endurance that, for example, a cruiser or destroyer has. And, and from the, yeah, that's right, if you have food for 600 hungry Marines, that, that'll do for 300 <laughs> sailors, right? Uh, talk to us uh, in terms of, um, you know, range. Is there a way you could put a range number on it? Because obviously if you convert all the ballast tanks to bunkerage, you're looking at significantly more fuel considering that ballasting is something this ship class does very, very well. It depends on the amount of uh, fuel usage for the radar, but with the with, a, with an IPS solution, I, I I see that you could put this ship out on station in the Middle Pacific or somewhere in the Northern Pacific, uh, in, in an appropriate environment to uh, to for, to provide fleet defense and ballistic missile defense, and you're probably looking at being able to ha have it out there three weeks on station between uh, hits from an oiler. Wow, that's that that's 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 some that's some nice talk. People will get very sloppy in their unwrapping <laughs> technique at that at that rate. Um, last question that I had for you is in terms of the power set. Obviously, you have a propulsion train and power generation sets that you have. You know, in the LPD-17 would be different for this because your power demand is is significantly higher. Where are you doing? What are you doing on the power generation side of things, especially in your generator sets? Uh, and how is the propulsion train? You know, you mentioned that there's a vast range of different things you can do, but on you know, from a, from a generation power generation standpoint, what sort of power generation are you going to need to equip this ship? Right. As you know now, it's equipped with uh, diesel uh, generators. We looked at the crossover point is, uh, is I believe, uh, uh, 20 uh, megawatts of power where it's much more efficient to go to gas turbines. So uh, whether you use uh, um, the same plant that they have on DDG-1000 or you use the, uh, the, the LM-2500s that, uh, that exist in the Aegis ships, uh, it, it, once, once the demand is over uh, 20 uh, megawatts, it makes sense to go to gas turbines. So we look at gas turbine and probably electric drive and electric power. But I will tell you that you could put, with electric drive, using about one-third of the, of the available volume on the ship, uh, we could generate about twice the power capability that a, uh, that a DDG-1000 has. And, and roughly how much power generation capability would you need in this configuration? In that configuration, uh, you would uh, you would need. Um, it, it depends on the radar. The radar is a big demand, but um, uh, I would say probably uh, uh, 50, 60 uh, megawatts of power, and we certainly could put uh, excuse, yeah, megawatts, uh, and we certainly could put much more than that on the ship. Steve, thanks very very much, and best of luck with the program. Thanks, Fago.